prophetic action, their prayerfully affirmative answers. At the same time, in and outside the churches, concerned citizens continue to face related signs of the times in the longer run that extends beyond this administration or this election. They do so amid diverging fortunes and diminished dreams of middle-class progress for all of a people of plenty. One of four Americans today earns less than the $8.70 per hour needed to keep a family of four above the official poverty line. Nearly one in three working families with children under 12, many with two parents, working full-time jobs at low wages and earning incomes well over the poverty line have faced at least one critical hardship over the course of a year, such as going without food, being evicted, and failing to receive needed medical care, according to a 2001 study by the Economic Policy Institute. Without higher wages or a stronger social safety net, work alone cannot ensure a decent standard of living for many families on the lower half of the income ladder in American society. And charity alone cannot make up the shortfall. What we own and owe only underscores the problem. One sixth of American households today owe more than they own. The bottom one third average less than $10,000 in net worth. The middle fifth of American households own 3.9% of our nation's wealth, their smallest share since 1962. The top fifth own 84% of all wealth. In 2001, government spending was smaller as a percentage of the U.S. national economy than at any other time since the 1960s, while one in six American children were living in poverty, roughly the same proportion as in 1979, and well above the rest of the industrialized world. The U.S. actually committed some 24.5% of its growth domestic product to social spending after taxes, comparable to Sweden at 27%, Britain at 26%, and the Netherlands at 25%. But in the distribution of its benefits, U.S. social spending is skewed sharply upward by virtue of including some seven to $800 billion per year granted by a hidden welfare state in the form of income tax credits and deductions that go to the better off in proportion to what they spend and save on home mortgage interest in particular, also on private health insurance, pension plans, and yes, higher education. We help the neediest, but we give more help to the most deserving, it seems, in terms of what they earn, spend, and save. Indeed, as fiscal conservatives protest, since 9-11, the federal government has shot up spending and deficits to pay the mushrooming costs of middle class entitlements, as well as to pay for war, and to do it by writing checks against our children's future. Americans remain deeply divided over what to think and do about these matters, particularly when it comes to voting and paying taxes or wages. However united they stand on the power of prayer and the value of volunteer work. If we seek to understand the good of government more aptly and persuasively, we need to ponder the good of do-gooding more fully and faithfully. Thinking twice about why mainline churches disagree over faith-based initiatives is one small step in this larger moral and social inquiry. Thank you for taking it with me. The floor is open. And, uh... say why the churches are saying no, I ask the question, are the churches really saying no? Because it seems to me that you're confusing um, the leadership and the denominations with being the church, not really paying attention to congregants, because public opinion tells us that for the most part, most Americans, except for Jews, are very much in favor of saying yes to this kind of compassionate conservatism. Great point. In... Uh, in one sense, yes, as I'm implying, however gently at the end, at least part of the enemy is us. 
that is, those of us who sit in the pews of many of the churches across the middle of our society. At the same time, um, when you ask Americans about, quote, compassionate conservatism or faith-based initiatives, what you get are relatively high answers in principle, but then when you specify in practice about, say, preferential hiring, or uh, how much can be given to whom, under what circumstances to do what, actually the opinions of support fall off, and they become much more selective. This is one reason why um, white, uh, quote, conservative evangelicals, many of them wound up opposing uh, the Bush plan because it seemed to retain discrimination in the form of discrimination against, quote, uh, indivisibly conversionist-centered programs. So uh, the kind of questions about a sort of broad uh, middle class um, moral constituency um, that's also in uh, a significant part uh, a constituency of folks in the pews is quite a posit. And uh, the kind of uh, character of public provision um, that is, um, by the usual measures, uh, in our case, remarkably oriented toward the middle, in some ways inverted in its proportion. Once you add in the, quote, hidden public provision uh, forms of uh, tax deduction, uh, write-off, and give-back is substantial. And we look different than every other society in the world, every other industrialized society. And that may well have something to do with the difference that we look like in terms of measures of where we look more like, well, we're between Turkey and Portugal, 16 to 22, rather than uh, kind of uh, uh, the standard, the usual suspects of Western Europe. Professor Sawyer. You raised at least indirectly, if not directly, the question of prison systems and the whole status of the penal system. And uh, I'm wondering if you could comment, either in terms of national evidence, but certainly in Georgia, we've had. Uh, a great deal of um, controversy over, over the question of chaplaincies and who's taking care of the prisoners. And it's really has, the doors have been open to entrepreneurial religion uh, in the prisons. Uh, is there something you could say to us about that? Because clearly there are a number of very, very competent chaplains now without a job in Georgia in the penal institutions. Don, I think you're uh, way ahead of me on that, specific to uh, the chaplaincies, and I'd like to turn the tables uh, on that one. But I, I think it is significant in the inaugural address that the matter of prisons in particular uh, and their proliferation is held up as what may well be, is probably, uh, quote, a matter of necessity. Um, but still, this question of, well, then what should we do? And uh, um, uh, uh, the matter of, uh, of uh, touching and healing and transforming the hearts of those incarcerated is in one sense, like many other proposals here, unarguable. In another sense, um, we'd have to step back to and into the legislative process to think about, well, which laws were violated, uh, how do they bear? Uh, obviously, the enormous explosion of incarceration um, for uh, drug violations, um, specifically for crack cocaine as opposed to powdered cocaine and uh, so on, and the uh, kind of enormous skew of the results of those laws and their violation uh, are worth looking at. Step back another step, and what's worth looking at is how powerfully um, that correlates not only with race, um, but by uh, class and occupation, especially as tied to education. And so this larger picture of, uh, and this is a generation long, um, and it's not um, specific to uh, one administration or another, to one party or another, the transformation of, um, if you will, the kind of deflection of this secular sort of anthropodicy, uh, prospect of progress being extended across the middle class um, to the whole society of, uh, and uh, hope in uh, a better life for one's children than oneself. All of that actually correlates very powerfully with the doubling of the size of the American middle class and real uh, per capita income between 1946 and 68. And since that point, um, there is a remarkable kind of skew in the impact of really structural economic changes um, that go around the world in terms of globalization, in terms of jobs in particular, also in terms of wages. That uh, if you're bright collar, um, if you're in the top uh, quintile or decile, like most of us in this room, you are, relatively speaking, protected and safe and uh, able to keep hoping with very good reason. Down below, 
things have gotten tighter. The middle class has expanded and now it is being pinched. And uh, uh, the kind of correlation um, with that, with education, with wages, with family uh, difficulty and conflict is very powerful and has implications on both sides of this, including folks fighting for family values. That declines in public participation from voting to other forms of civic volunteering are striking over the last generation as opposed to the generation before as you go down the social economic ladder. That actually church-going, uh, quote, conservative white evangelicals and church-going African Americans are two exceptions to this kind of decline. Um, they are, as it were, um, uh, part of the, uh, the, uh, the exceptions to the rule that are uh, a good story about public participation for all the kinds of, of protest and complaint at loggerheads uh, um, that are sometimes seen emanating from religious groups, especially, quote, uh, conservative religious groups. Now, I haven't answered your question. And, and I might say, Don, that, that the notion of changing the heart of, the, uh, of prisoners is uh, also tied to what looks to be, quote, the failure of liberal forms of penology, rehabilitation, okay. social transformation uh, to do the job. And, uh, and in fact, uh, that, uh, as well you know, is a kind of continuing moral uh, debate not just a debate about social policy, in which there is, at least to quote, liberalize uh, a fair amount of evidence that no, all sorts of programs have done uh, a very significant job, from Head Start to uh, real job programs. And in one sense, that's a debate uh, that has quieted down or subdued over the last decade, and where both parties have reached uh, at least a measure of convergence. And uh, uh, as it were, the, the argument over one incumbency party um, as well as two parties that do disagree on all sorts of things. Yeah, the only comment I just, I was struck by how the entrepreneurially religious uh, have really been given open doors, uh, whereas, uh, you know, uh, mainline support for um, perhaps, shall we say, more sophisticated or more informed in certain ways, prison ministry, uh, has gone by the board. And, and it's, it's particularly true here in Georgia for any of you who've follow this issue. That was, that was the main thing that I wanted to tie in with your, your notion. And of course, if we took an economic reading of who's in there and who's most likely to be imprisoned in the next five years and so on, then we've got another economic, social economic factor. But it's entrepreneurial religion of, of that sort that really has the door open to them and it doesn't cost the public anything. I mean, that's the, that's the tie in with your main thesis here. I mean, one of them. service and charity providers, the bulk of it goes to uh, very few, very large uh, entities, notably Catholic Charities and Lutheran, um, uh, also Church World Services, the National Council of Churches. So it is no accident, and not, again, not just a political gambit, that much of this initiative has been um, at least orchestrated in relationship to smaller independent churches, including African American churches that, if you look at the numbers, have relatively little access. And as a matter of fact, in the course of this legislative debate, um, uh, particularly with uh, policy decisions about preferential hiring and uh, conversionist uh, cases and only going through vouchers, Catholic Charities came back in behalf of the legislation, in part, some insiders said, because they knew they'd clean up and would lose little or nothing of their lion's share of uh, safe funding. instituted his uh, faith-based prison program at Lottie and one other, I guess. Uh, and that's the place where they have run into problems with extremist groups coming into these prisons and getting funding and getting access to the prisoners, even groups, Christian uh, identity groups, Nation of Islam, and some of the other uh, more extremist groups have, have, who are not necessarily getting funding for providing social services in the cities 
are getting access into these prisons in Florida and, and, and will elsewhere as that grows. So the sword of non-discrimination cuts uh, two or more ways, and that's been a continuing theme through the legislative debate. And the different forms of discrimination and the difficulties of uh, public funding of uh, religious communities uh, to do uh, the provision of social services. And uh, I mean, I'd, uh, I, I think that's a good example. Yeah. between the uh, leadership, the Washington offices, the New York offices of the liberal Protestant denominations and the congregations. Because it seems to me like a study like Ram Canans, which was more of liberal Protestant churches, which was looking at the actual social provision of congregations, is suggesting that um, congregations in a, in a disorganized way, you could say, are doing a lot of social provision. Absolutely. Um, and are understanding that as one of their roles. What it, but Chavez makes a little comment where he says, and it's interesting that the congregations don't really do anything political. Uh, and there's where you see the split between the congregations and the leadership, because the leadership is practicing a form of public theology, looking at the structural issues, lobbying, you know, all that. And that while at the, the, the broader, the local levels of the church are, are, are engaged in these kinds of provision, but that, that thinking does never moves forward, as you're suggesting, to the underlying structural questions. And I just wondered, as you keep working with this, if you've thought of, if you can imagine, or if you've seen the denominations imagining any ways that that split can be uh, overcome. Yeah, um, uh, again, uh, point well taken. membership in political and also kind of economic and educational terms especially, like the UCC and the Unitarians that came out against uh, faith-based initiatives. The larger denominations on this issue and many others in the pews are actually split on, on many such matters. And um, at the same time, uh, particularly over the last really two decades, you can see public provision in terms of food pantries, in terms of shelters and so on, that has increased, particularly in uh, sorry, the, the quote, inner city or inner suburban uh, congregations, has increased sometimes by factors of three, four, six, or more. So there, there are, quote, two, there are different things going on, as well as the whole question of what can we do uh, in which uh, uh, feeding uh, the hungry and uh, sheltering the homeless right here, right on our own streets, um, right downtown or nearby. Um, that seems uh, unargued, unequivocal. Uh, at the same time, uh, that this kind of gap is actually, uh, and it depends, depends on which denominations we're talking about, even though you can see the whole matter of kind of public advocacy, uh, in which uh, uh, the largest denominations are sometimes uh, the ones that seem both most hamstrung or have the least support, at least the church leaders in Washington uh, often complain, we've got the least support from we're blaming the folks that are out there working hard. One more question. Maybe I'll steal the, the uh, lecture in a second. We um, invited the top three people in the faith-based initiatives office to come here, and when they heard it was Steve Tipton, they all ducked. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to mimic their question. And the question they may ask is this. We have suffered in this country says the operative of the faith-based initiatives program by abstemious if not slavish adherence to the separation of church and state such that we have cut out of the social welfare system the historical ally to political authorities namely religious groups finally in this faith-based initiatives program we have made bold to answer the U.S. Supreme Court's invitation over the last few years to rethink our positions on separation of church and state. And we have now put in place a program to allow for voluntary participation by religious groups in the delivery of charity and other forms of social welfare to our neediest citizens. You can critique this, Professor Tipton, with a wonderful critique of my entire administration's policy on all manner of things of taxation and military and all the rest, but the fact of the matter is, we are putting hundreds of millions of dollars back 
in front of the people in the streets who need the money the most and we're using a fundamental conduit, namely religious organizations, to deliver those services in a way they uniquely can and without having to rebuild, without having to inflate the bureaucracy. And so putting aside all the disclaimers about our tax policy and military policy and the like, what's wrong with our trying to help people in need and enlisting those who have been doing this for 4,000 years in the delivery of same? That would be the, tip, the question to Tipton by the Faith-Based Initiative Office, I think. Thank you, John. Just one more indication of why you should run for higher office, if not the highest office in the land. Uh, two points, um, and both of them uh, less arguments than observations. The first point is, uh, contra any picture of the uh, public square depleted of the faithful and of their uh, moral advocacy, um, the facts are just uh, the opposite, that we have actually increased uh, moral advocacy as well as specifically religious advocacy, more religion-like advocacy in our polity, that it is now more densely crowded, formally organized, that the number of advocacy groups that are religiously related, not just denominationally related, in some ways that's the least of these, um, uh, has mushroomed, that in 1960 there were maybe 30 national public affairs uh, organizations not tied to this or that denomination or church uh, on the public scene. Um, today, uh, well, by say mid-1980s, it was about 300. Today, it's probably 1,000 or more. At the same time that this, and this kind of tenfold growth above specifically church offices um, and denominational agencies, at the same time, the proliferation of moral advocacy groups that are not explicitly religious is probably by a factor of 10 yet again. We have, an, as it were, an individualistic polity where we've got state expansion, a big and uh, apparently powerful uh, state, but it's very permeable. And so we have had a kind of, of uh, sort of ongoing multiplication, as well as increased division and increasingly integrated national argument about how we ought to do things like public provision. And um, the money, quote, has gone up too, um, uh, uh, well before uh, this administration or this go around on uh, faith-based initiatives. And that's really the second point, which is that if you look at the character of our public provision, not just this or that, uh, quote, welfare, or work for fair program, what's remarkable about it is that it is uh, actually quite generous, but it is distributed differently. And uh, it increasingly uh, has gone to the middle class and the upper middle class uh, as a part of the tr larger transformation of the kind of pinching of the lower middle and middle middle class really since uh, the late 1960s. And those background considerations are actually very relevant here. When you look at the larger amount of public provision, including just this kind of hidden provision alone of seven, eight hundred billion dollars a year, the real numbers that have been talked about in terms of faith-based initiatives stand out as being tiny. They are $100 million uh, at most and less. And there were two executive orders in 2002 and one this year, um, and uh, uh, the largest uh, uh, amount provided was about $100 million. And this is largely uh, shuffled amounts within the existing uh, forms of provision that are still uh, dominated by Catholic uh, charities, Lutherans, Church World Services. But uh, I'm ready to vote for you nonetheless. <laughs> All right. I'm glad they, they stayed in Washington. They would not have been able to go, go back, I think. I told you that Stephen Tipton is a treasure on this campus, and we've just seen another virtuoso display of, of intellectual fortitude and, and compassionate thinking, as well as compassionate learning. And I hope that you will join me in a robust round of applause to thank Steve Tipton. <laughs> I hope that you will be enticed to return to our Family Forum series. If you look in the little red flyer in front of you, you'll see on October 6 at 2.30, we have a forum, Spare the Child. Our colleague, uh, Professor Jan Pratt, will be leading a group of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim thinkers and public policy advocates and religious leaders 
led by Monica Kaufman, Martha Feynman, and others to talk about the issue of domestic discipline, especially discipline of children. A hard issue, contested issue, and one that will be amply ventilated from this lectern. Uh, we hope that you will also give us, do us the favor, please, and look at that little yellow sheet that you got when you came in the door. And if you would be so kind as to simply indicate to us and hand to one of the people at the door how you heard about this forum so we can be more effective in spreading the word about these fora in the future, I'd be most grateful. And finally, I hope you will join me in expressing thanks to my colleagues in the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion who are instrumental in organizing today's forum and the forum that you have before you, in particular April Bogle, Eliza Ellison, Anita Mann, Amy Wheeler, and Janice Wiggins. Will you join me in a round of applause thanking them for their work? And one final round for Steve Tipton and join us outside for a little refreshments. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. All right, all right, Beautifully done. All right. Superb.